the ferry steams away from the wharf, leaving the historic city of Istanbul behind. It is heading out into the Sea of Marmara on one of its regular trips to the islands off the coast of Turkey. The people aboard pay little attention to one of their fellow passengers. A quiet man, calmly reading a newspaper. They don't realize he is one of the great spiritual leaders of the world, a leader who is playing a critical role in saving them from environmental dangers that grow worse every day dangers that threaten the lives of us all. To commit a crime against the natural world is a sin. For human beings to destroy the biological diversity of God's creation. For human beings to contaminate the Earth's waters. Its land its air and its life. All of these are sins. The ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew is the anointed leader of the Orthodox Church the oldest of the Christian religions. A family of independent churches with 300 million followers. From his first days in office, he has made the environment a vital spiritual mission. His dedication to saving the earth has earned him the title, the Green Patriarch. When His All Holiness Bartholomew became the Ecumenical Patriarch in November of 1991, he was the 270th in a line that stretches back unbroken to St. Andrew, one of the original 12 Apostles of Jesus Christ. The Patriarch is the protector of a rich and ancient tradition from which he has taken the concept of sin and applied it to today's wanton abuse of the environment. Persist in the current path of ecological destruction is not only folly, it is a sin against God and creation. Until recently, the normal view would be, well, sin only concerns what you do to other people. But it was stated very clearly, what you do to the animals, to the trees, to the air, the earth, the water. If you misuse them, this too is sinful. The Ecumenical Patriarch was the first leader of his stature in the Christian community to have made uh, environmental issues uh, or caring for God's creation one of, a, a key issue. When some of his early pronouncements came out, I was quite aware of them because not too many senior religious leaders had said anything, you know, about caring for God's creation up until that point. If we start now, if uh, those who go to confession, confess their sins and so on, if they start confessing sins against the environment, this will be a success, uh, an immense success. It's a revolution. The Ecumenical Patriarch decided to use his influence to bring people together to solve our common problem. He'd connect people who had the power to save the environment to those who had the knowledge. 
He would bring together scientists, religious leaders, government officials, media representatives, and ordinary citizens in a series of shipboard symposia. They'd share information on the environmental crisis and pool their combined expertise to find solutions. What is interesting about the Orthodox Church initiative is that, as far as I am aware, this is the only group where the initiative is either being actually taken by or at least involves the very highest church authority. I don't remember any other patriarch doing this. Not a patriarch, not a pope, not a Protestant leader, not uh, a Jewish leader, um, nor anybody from the Muslim world or any other world who stood up and said, this is a moral imperative, we've got to do something about it. The Patriarch's plan was very simple, but as it turned out, not so easy to execute. His guests were people who had never before had the occasion, or perhaps the desire, to talk to each other, particularly the religious leaders and the scientists. Uh, when I was invited, I was a little bit suspicious because, uh, as you know, scientists don't look to religion with uh, a lot of trust. Science and religion have traditionally not gotten along. And a little bit of humility from both helps a lot. Scientists in general just do not give a damn with what the religion people have to say philosophically about the way to do science. Uh, I would say the scientists were more open towards theology than theology was open towards science. And so, it was important at the first symposium to have them on a boat so that they would not disappear suddenly. The split between science and religion is centuries old. For scientists, defying church doctrine once meant death. In the 1500s, Nicolaus Copernicus feared persecution from the Catholic Church so much that he waited until he was on his deathbed to publish his theory that the sun was the center of our planetary system, not the Earth. Though Copernicus escaped punishment, those who subscribed to his theory were not so lucky. Giordano Bruno was imprisoned for his heretical views, tortured for eight years, then in 1600, burned at the stake. 32 years later, Galileo wrote a book offering his own proof that Copernicus was right. The Pope banned it, threatened Galileo with torture, and sentenced him to a lifetime of house arrest. This situation, in my, my view, uh, produced um, a reaction. So first you, you develop a, a doubt about anything that is not explained. So you reject faith, because faith is the territory of your enemy. Rifts between science and religion are often as bitter today as in the past, particularly in areas like creation theory, stem cell research, and human cloning. But the patriarch hoped the fragile state of the environment would help the two sides find common ground. The wise men of the antiquity, they were also the priests, and they knew about the stars and plants and animals and meteorology and, and the soul and the spirit and the world. There was a separation. And it's about time we, we overcome this. The ecumenical patriarch began his campaign to save the environment by taking his influential guests to some of the world's worst environmental hotspots. In the Gulf of Finland, where contaminated water creates health hazards for millions, he took them on a tour of a new sewage treatment plant. Something that I shall never forget is walking through a sewage plant with His All Holiness, the Ecumenical Patriarch of Constantinople, accompanied by the world's press, striding through these remarkable caverns and seeing what enormous ingenuity had gone into dealing with a problem that, as we know, everywhere has to deal with in one way or another. In Porto Romano, Albania, the Patriarch brought his guests to an abandoned chemical factory. 
The site is so polluted that those living nearby daily absorb deadly poisons through their skin. Thanks to the Patriarch, scientists and journalists had a rare chance to discuss the toxic dump site with the country's president. I realize that it's a very expensive problem to solve. Yes. But um, there is a simple thing that could be done, which the, fin the, the entire site could be, could be simply fenced off. No, I don't, I don't believe on the fence, because uh, if you have a, a local infection, it doesn't mean that this will be localized all the time. No one's suggesting that's, that's the total answer, Mr. President, but suggesting a way of stopping more people being I answer that question. In the Amazon, the Patriarch and his guests became eyewitnesses to the destruction of the rainforest. We came to see and to learn, to see with our own eyes. We go back more rich in knowledge and in experience. In the Baltic, the Patriarch focused the world's attention on fish species that once seemed infinite and are now close to extinction. There was a, there was a day, it's not so far, not so long ago, where people talk about that the sea is not possible for man to empty the sea. It was, everyone talked about it. Sea is so big that it's not possible for us to take away the resources. Today, everyone say we, it was wrong. You know, they catch it up to one million tons of codfish. And then it's going down, going down, going down. And when it reaches around 150,000 tons, and it's never been re restored. Even fishery is stopped, the cut is not coming back. And in Greenland, he took his guests to the edge of a fjord to watch million-year-old glaciers melting into mist. Even while facing the worst of the problems, the Patriarch rarely misses an opportunity to enjoy the world he's working so hard to save. <laughs> Whenever possible, he bypasses riding in cars for a simple walk in the open air. You want to walk? Okay. <laughs> I like to walk. Like all leaders, he kisses babies. But for the patriarch, it's one of the benefits. Their eyes and their innocence are a part of paradise. <laughs> <laughs> No matter where he is in the world, the Patriarch is rarely alone. His days booked solid with meetings with his followers, church leaders, and heads of state. He has received the United States Congressional Medal of Honor from President Bill Clinton, won Norway's prestigious Sophie Prize for his inventive approach to environmental problems, and been named a Champion of the Earth by the United Nations. He is the sort of leader who doesn't lead exactly by coming out front. He leads by advice, above all by encouragement. What he doesn't do is come out front with the flag and march you know, ahead of the troops. Um, he can't do that.
He can't do that because the Patriarch is the calm center of a political storm. The eye of a conflict between East and West that began long ago. The Orthodox Christian faith was founded in the ancient city of Byzantium, which became Constantinople in the 4th century AD under the reign of Constantine the Great, the first Roman emperor to convert to Christianity. Gradually, the Byzantine Empire, created by Constantine, gave way to the rule of the Ottoman Turks. After the fall of Constantinople, the Patriarch continued to be regarded by the Turkish Ottoman authorities as the head of the Orthodox people. And so Constantinople retained its importance right up until the 20th century. In the turmoil following the First World War, with the demise of the Ottoman Empire and the establishment of a Turkish Republic, more than a million Orthodox Christians were expelled from Muslim Turkey in the 1920s. This meant that the Patriarch lost most of his local flock. However, the Christians in Constantinople itself were allowed to remain, though because of pressures since 1955, most of them are now gone. Under Turkish rule, the Patriarchate has frequently been the object of political or religious persecution. Seven Patriarchs were killed while in office. Other Patriarchs deposed and forced out. Even today, Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew finds himself under threat. Radical Muslims frequently stage protests, hanging him in effigy, demanding that he and his followers abandon his faith's ancient homeland. There is no doubt that the Patriarch's position at the moment within Turkey is a difficult one. The Turkish government considers that he is simply the head of a rather small minority of Christians in Istanbul, and they do not recognize him as the leader of a worldwide Orthodox community. It's been sometimes suggested that because of pressures from the Turkish government, restrictions on the Patriarchate's work, he ought to move somewhere else. I believe he would not wish to move. If he were expelled, that would be another question. But he would feel it is his duty and his privilege to remain where he is and support the local Greek community who are his flock in the city of Constantinople itself. On this morning, the Patriarch is on his way to the island of Halki, an hour's ferry ride from Istanbul. There, a horse-drawn carriage takes the Patriarch up to the top of the island, up to a hill called Hope. In the 9th century, Byzantine monks built a monastery there. Since 1844, it has been a theological school of the Orthodox Church. For the Patriarch, a visit there is always a kind of homecoming. Over the years, the school has educated hundreds of the church's top religious leaders, including 12 ecumenical patriarchs, the Patriarch Bartholomew among them. Hi. 
Rodríguez Barcelona. He came to Halki for the first time when he was 17 and spent 11 years of his life here, seven as a student and four as a teacher. The Patriarch was born on an island very similar to Halki, on the small island of Imvros in the Aegean Sea. There, he first learned to treasure the natural world. In, in Imvros we had uh, uh, goats, sheep, cats, donkey. Here at Halki, the Patriarch can take a moment or two to revisit his youth. <laughs> Whenever he has the opportunity to be uh, in a place like uh, Imbros, he always goes back in his childhood and he would say, oh, uh, when I was a child, we were going on the mountain and in the sea, and it was so nice to climb the mountains. And uh, this feeling gives him so much uh, strength that even now he will climb on the mountains and he will run so fast that uh, we cannot follow him. This is the Easter flower, Pascha Paschalia. This island is a welcome respite for the busy patriarch, but it is Halki's place in the history of his faith that is most precious. These are my predecessors. This is my private apartment here. An ideal place for study, for prayer, for meditation. Unfortunately closed. More than a hundred Orthodox Christian students used to fill the classrooms here at Halki. But the school is empty now. Only a few caretakers tend the grounds. We used to have lunch all together here. The dean, professors, and the students. In 1971, the Turkish government ordered the school shut down, and it has remained closed ever since. I would guess that the Turkish instinct is that it is not very good news if he becomes too prominent in the world. If he were to become a major world actor, I think that would be upsetting to the Turkish state. I think there's a good deal of respect among Turks generally for the Patriarchate, and I'm just very puzzled as to why the official attitude continues to be as hard-edged as it seems to be. It's not as if the Patriarch is a threat to Turkey. And in fact, I would think that they would look upon the Patriarch and the Patriarchate as something to be proud of. He doesn't go out there and give big press conferences. He doesn't give interviews. In one sense, it's a pity, because if he were to come out and say, yes, I am the Green Patriarch, and this is what I want the world to do, what I want to do, uh, it would be sensational. Instead, the Patriarch spends a great deal of time working behind the scenes, often without credit. Building bridges is part of the Patriarchate's history and commitment. 
So the ecumenical patriarchate has always looked to build bridges. It's always sought to find ways of dialogue with other churches, with other faiths. In 2002, at the Church of Santa Polinaire in Italy, a church famous for its mosaics of the natural world, the Patriarch embraced an opportunity to forward the cause of the environment, while at the same time helping to repair an historic rift, the Great Schism of 1054 AD, between the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church. The Archbishop of Ravenna allowed the Patriarch to perform the Orthodox liturgy for the first time in more than a millennium. With every hymn, every prayer, history was being created, division was being healed. The whole atmosphere uh, of the church, uh, this famous basilica, was very inspiring and uh, feelings of the numerous congregation who attended the liturgy uh, were very positive, very moving. I was deeply moved. I think uh, most people there were deeply moved. It was an extraordinary, remarkably rewarding event, which symbolized perhaps more than anything else, the coming together of religions. It was historic, but I hope and pray that it was also prophetic, a sign that perhaps the concern for the environment is going to bring the great churches together again. Soon after the ceremony in Ravenna, the Green Patriarch gained a powerful ally. Pope John Paul II agreed to sign a common declaration on environmental ethics via satellite link from Rome. The Declaration explicitly made the environment the responsibility of human beings. It said, in part, We have not been entrusted with unlimited power over creation. We are only stewards of a common heritage. When we signed this statement of environmental commitment, it was as if two lungs of a single body were expressing a fervent desire to breathe the clean air of an unpolluted world. The declaration ended on a note of great hope. It is not too late. God's world has incredible healing powers. Within a single generation, we could steer the earth toward our children's future. Let that generation start now, with God's help and blessing. I think that the Venice Declaration may prove to be extremely significant, because it's in the bank, you see. This has been said by a pope. This is now official teaching. The patriarch has pulled out the Vatican energy and commitment on this issue. The Patriarch has led, the Vatican has responded, and that kind of collaboration between religions, ecumenically, I think is an example of how effective this movement can really be. Since the death of Pope John Paul II, the Patriarch has enhanced the Vatican's commitment with the new Pope, Benedict XVI. In 2006, the Patriarch and the Pope signed another joint declaration emphasizing 
as religious leaders, we consider it one of our duties to encourage and to support all efforts made to protect God's creation. The Patriarch is reaching out to all spiritual leaders, not only those who head Christian religion. How are you? I'm very well. He's drawing in very senior leaders from a diversity of religious traditions and really creating a forum where they're able not only to speak with scientists and people in the development community and people concerned with uh, human rights and social equity, but they're also able to speak among themselves and to compare and contrast some of the approaches each of the faiths can bring to the environment issue. In Paris, he spoke so strongly about Islamic tradition in protecting the environment. And coming from a orthodox patriarch, that was very important. When we hear people from different religious orders speaking about other religions in a very positive manner, in an open manner. And uh, he does that, I've seen him. In the Amazon, the Patriarch took the unprecedented step of inviting indigenous people to join him, an act criticized by some of his own followers. Centuries ago, the arrival of European conquerors decimated the indigenous populations dismissed their spiritual beliefs, enslaved them, and converted them to Catholicism, sometimes forcibly. On this occasion, however, the Patriarch made it possible for shamans to stand side by side with Orthodox Christians, Catholics, and Protestants. They were very happy and satisfied that we respected them and their traditions. The view of this native Amazonian Indian mm -hmm. to bless a guy from the Catholic Church like he did today with grace and kindness was so powerful because this is a representative of an institution that signified their suffering for 500 years. And now this guy here comes there, very symbolic, in the Amazon River, and blasts the, the representative of the church. In the last analysis, it was uh, proved that we need each other. They need our advanced science and development, and we need their traditions and uh, their closeness to the creation of God. The Patriarch has been championing the environment for almost two decades now. The long years of effort are paying off. The Green Patriarch can now count numerous success stories. The spotlight the Patriarch put on Porto Romano has helped persuade the World Bank to spend five million dollars to clean up the toxic chemical site. One could argue that that would never have happened if the symposium hasn't visited the place and embarrassed the president into taking some action. In Brazil, the Patriarch connected scientist Antonio Nobre with environmentalist Gerard Moss. Together, they created a project that involves measuring the water-bearing air currents high above the Amazon rainforest, currents they call flying rivers. You could test and check how the Amazon is pumping water vapor in the air, and this gets carried away through on the wind and brought to the areas that otherwise would be desert. And this project is now taking off and it will be a series of programs in the Brazilian TV. The Patriarch's visit to the Baltic inspired Bread and Fish, an organization of farmers, fishermen, and government leaders 
that hopes to restore the devastated fish stocks by continuing the communication and cooperation started by the Patriarch. He is, has been able, with his moral authority, to create a dialogue and create a new movement. To have religion become partner with nature and partner with people, and to have the real roots of religion kept alive for being a savior of humanity and nature rather than a threat to humanity and nature, a source of love and compassion rather than a source of hate and intolerance. Uh, for me, it's, it's like oxygen. Look, we have only one planet. This is a very delicate environmental balance that we live within. It's, you know, it's probably one of the reasons why many of us are religious, because we have something here in this ecosystem of ours, which um, is so extraordinary. It's hard not to believe that some greater power than ourselves had something to do with us. Though the Patriarch has accomplished a great deal, more needs to be done. Scientists tell us we have less than 10 years to curb greenhouse gases and limit global warming. Otherwise, it will be too late. We're going to lose unless someone can bring massive numbers of people into the discussion. And I believe that the best way to do that is going to be the religious community. We people of religion uh, have to inspire more and more our faithful to give them a good example. If we have arrived in this critical point uh, today, it means that we uh, representatives of religion did not fulfill our mission. We need moral leadership. People are feeling this urgency as never before. The awareness has arisen about climate change, about a whole range of issues, species extinction, pollution, and so on. We must respond as religious people to this critical moment. And I think we have now that possibility, and in large measure because of the early and consistent and authentic leadership of His All Holiness Bartholomew. Now that religion is here and bringing the moral message, things will start to change. This is what happened with the slavery issue. This is what happened with civil rights. As Orthodox Christians, we use the Greek keros to describe a moment in time which has eternal significance. For the human race as a whole, there is now a keros, a decisive time in our relationship with God's creation. We will either act in time to protect life on earth from the worst consequences of human folly, or we will fail to act. May God grant us the wisdom to act in time. On a cloudy September day, a passenger ship cut through the waters of the Arctic Ocean off the coast of Greenland. On the deck, the Ecumenical Patriarch gathered religious leaders from nearly a dozen different doctrines. They stood silent, each in his or her own way, sending a prayer to the infinite. 